I don't know if I should leave, if I should keep on talking. I don't, I don't know what to do here. Cornell! What do I do? I don't know what to do. Help. Help. Are we still live or no? Oh, there he is. Welcome to the Build on Beauty podcast, where beauty is born skin deep. Now, here's your host, author, speaker, entrepreneur, Cornell Germain. Thank you for joining me. I have a special guest with me. She is an author, mentor, speaker, pastor, and daughter of the world-renowned Bishop T.D. Jakes. Please help me welcome Cora Jakes Coleman. Cora, how you doing? Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Anytime. Listen, we have some good content to get into today. But before we do, I've got to get your thoughts. Um, There's so much going on. As a black woman, uh, a black mother, uh, a woman of faith, a leader, um, I've got to get your thoughts on Black Lives Matter, uh, what's happening uh, with racism here in America and, and this, just the social injustice that we're seeing in our country. What's, what are your thoughts? Well, I think um, like many are saying, it's not something that hasn't been going on. It's just more light to it. There's more cameras. People, people have their media with them. So we're living in a time where great exposure is prevalent every single day. And so I think that my my take is keep on exposing, you know, in order for us to really effectively make change, we're going to have to expose the errors in the system, whether it's through protesting, social media, doing shows, magazines, articles, whatever it is your assignment and call is for this season and time, I think it's important for us to not stop. I think we we have a habit of wanting instant gratification and instant change and and we won't walk long. We won't we won't fight long. We won't endure. And I think that this is going to require a great endurance from our people and if we're not willing to endure, then it's just going to be another black man that has died, another black woman that has died, another just rude and rural system that we will continue to perpetuate because we're not willing to endure. And so I think one of the greatest things about our ancestors is their endurance. You know, when you think of Harriet Tubman walking a hundred miles for her freedom, like, do you know how much endurance it takes? It takes me endurance to walk a half a mile around my corner. Do you hear me? Like, I, I get a little winded just half around the block. This baby walked a hundred miles, okay, for freedom. And, and that's the kind of endurance we need to have. We're, we're not going to effectively make change if we don't endure. And so we have to endure. And I, I'm here for the Black Lives Matter message, not the movement. I don't know what it what the movement is about and who is over the movement and who is leading the movement. And it, it sounds a little sketchy what's going on with the movement. But I'm here for the Black Lives Matter message and, and what the message represents for our people. Um, and I think that it's time. I have a six-year-old son, I have a 12-year-old um, biracial daughter, and it's important for me to not worry about my son playing water guns at the park. Like yesterday, or no, just last week, he wanted to go to the park and play water gun, play with water guns. And I was like, no. But I, I think we have to effectively make change so that we can see a freedom for our children that even if we don't get to see, at least we've made a change for our children. Wow. Yeah, you mentioned having uh, two beautiful children, um, and you're also a youth pastor. But I have, got, I have to ask, uh, how do we handle this topic when it comes to our young people? Many of them um, don't understand, and some are have, have been just desensitized. How do we talk to them about these issues, especially our black boys? 
I am actually the children's pastor. And so I've got the babies all the way up to like early 13 year olds. And like I said, I like, like I said, I have two children and they're kind of wide range. So having to be able to discuss this effectively with my son and with my daughter has been challenging um, to, to say the least. You know, I have my son who is just such a loving person. So he wants everybody to know black and white lives matter. So I have to like tell him why people are saying black lives matter. And then he's like mad because he's like, why do people not like us because of something that silly mommy? So that has been difficult. And my daughter, though she is half black, she looks more Hispanic than she looks black. And so I've had to really sit down with both of my children and not speak to them from a perspective of racism, but speak to them from a perspective of love. Children can understand love more than they can understand hate. And, and it's something that is taught and it's something that is easy for a child to understand from a five-year-old to a 12-year-old. There are, there are more things that a child can show you that they love than they could tell you that they hate. And so I think that it's important for us to just kind of sit our children down and talk to them about the difference of people. You know, like it's not a race thing. Some people are raised to hate. Some people are raised to love. Some people are, are generationally prone to the character and behaviors that they project. Like that is, is my daddy taught me and then my granddad taught my dad and my granddad's granddad taught him. And so we're, we're dealing with a generational plague of racism. And so I think that it's really, really important for us to be able to sit our children down and talk to them about the, the love of God, uh, respecting the process and the timings that we're in and really giving them an opportunity to know that it's okay to love someone who may not look like you, who may be different than you. I don't ever wanna teach my children to be the bully. I want them to be the one that stands behind the bully and fights with them. Mm, so good, so good. Speaking of generations, you're the daughter of uh, Bishop... T.D. Jakes, uh, do you recall him uh, ever having to sit down and talk to you or your brothers and sisters about race uh, in America or hatred in America? Uh, do you recall any of those conversations growing up? Absolutely. My my father is so uh, he's he's pure Nigerian. And so when he went to Africa and, and visited, you know, where slaves were held and and some of the, the just the beatings and things, uh, beating posts and things like that in Africa, but then also got to see the, the richness and the wealth of Africa as well. I can remember as a little girl, him coming home and introducing us to African garb and, and the linens and just the different color patterns and kind of showing us that beyond slavery, that there's a richness and a wealth within our culture that we often don't, don't as my generation tap into. When, when you talk about uh, Black people in my generation, our most recent and um, effective communication is going to be slavery. And so when my, when my father went to Africa, he was able to see beyond slavery, the wealth and the richness of our culture. And so I can just remember my dad really talking to us about, you know, you weren't just a slave. You know, our people come from wealth. They come from intellect. They come from strength and power. And really just being empowered by my father in that moment made me even more proud to be a black woman, you know? And not only am I a black woman, I'm a dark skinned black woman. And so I, I grew up just kind of really heeding to my dad, kind of uh, just making us really acknowledge and praise the power of our culture and, and the wealth of our culture. And just that we are not just slaves, but we are inventors, we are creators, we are kings, we are queens, we are royal. 
Um, it, it was a, a very powerful thing to grow up in. And so I think that that's what makes me powerful now. It's just like as a child, my father never made us feel bad about being Black, if that makes sense. Like we were never made to feel like this is a weight, it's heavy, it's a burden, but we were always empowered to be Black, to accept our culture, to walk boldly and strong in our culture, and always will be. I am proud to be a Black woman, and I'm teaching my children the same. Mm, that is so good and so important because I, I remember back in the day when um, and probably still happens now in our in our uh, black families. But we were taught you had to be better than uh, your white counterparts or do half as much or double, uh, excuse me, to get half uh, as where as they are, you know, and just it just, you know, this whole idea of having to measure your your success or your uh, ambition by what your white counterparts were doing. It, it just to me creates such a uh, unfair advantage and, and it's so, somewhat of a complex for our black children. Why, why not uh, just measure your, your success and, and your ambition in life by what it is that you're, that you want, or, or, you know, your, your vision or your dream, uh, what it is that you carrying on the inside versus uh, this, these, these external measures that, that have been placed by society, if you will, you know? So it's just a little thought I had uh, when you were talking, but it, it just, it seems just so, um, damaging you know uh, if you will but we have to talk about uh, uh, your mentoring program you have a mentoring program called uh, mentoring with Cora and mentoring is such a necessary component to uh, getting to the next le- next level of success or anywhere in life um, tell us more about uh, mentoring with Cora yes I am um... I absolutely agree that it is important for us to have mentorship. Um, for me, mentoring was was less about like getting people to the next level and more about healing people so that they would move effortlessly into the next level. And so um, I find that, and, and this is even for me, that what we're not willing to invest in, we don't invest in. And so So it's like my my kids, if they have something that we sign up for free, I'm less likely to get them there. But if I have to pay for something that my kids have to go to, they're more likely to make it because I've put some type of investment into it. And so for me, uh, there's such a healing component into my mentoring. There's such a a faith component to my mentoring that I really want to give people people an opportunity to have someone to face their fears with. Because I think a lot of mentors can kind of give you like a vision board and kind of a vision plan on what you need to do. But when it comes to facing those things that hurt you, those rapes, those molestations, those bullying moments, those traumas that have happened in your life, having to go back and look at those things and not having someone hold your hand while doing so can can bring on even more trauma. So I love being able to be the one to say, hey, we're going back. And we are going to look at these things. We're not going to look at them to beat you up, but we're going to look at them to build you up. And I'm here and I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to walk you through this so that you don't have to go through the healing process alone. I think that we have learned how to hurt alone. And I think that we have tried to heal alone, but mentoring really gives us an opportunity to have an adequate and effective person teach us how to heal properly. I think our bones and uh, spiritual bones uh, need someone who can teach us how to heal those spiritual bones properly, how to heal our spiritual mind and our emotional heart. And that's what mentoring with core is about. It's not a pastor thing. It's just an opportunity for me to be able to say, hey, I want you to be healed. I want you to be whole and you don't have to do it alone. And so you can join this program and I'll help you face some of the hardest things that it is for you to face and we'll walk through them together. Mm. Uh, When it comes to healing, give us a little tidbit. What is uh, the Cora message when it comes to uh, starting that process of healing? Oh, we've got to get to the roots. We have to get to the root. I tell every single mentee, we have to get to the root of the thing. I'm never going to start in your now. 
I'm going to go back to the roots. A lot of the reasons why we have the relationships that we have is because of our relationships with our parents. Um, our relationships with friends start from the foundation of our relationships with siblings. And so I'm always, I am a root person. I will always be a root person because I believe that just because a tree is beautiful, the substance of that tree, what makes that tree beautiful is a root thing. It's not a leaf and branch thing, but it's about the roots that are in that tree. And if I can help to decontaminate some of the roots or even cleanse and move some things out of the roots that are causing a hindrance in growth, that is my go to. Every mentee that has been sent to me, I know for a fact have been sent by God. And um, our first session, I always end up finding out like, this is specifically why you're here for this person. This is specifically why you're here for this person. And, um, and it's really just been fun to watch them go from a real dark and broken and hurting and lost place to a free, confident, bold place. Like I'm like, warriors are rising. And if I get to be just a portion of someone's process, that just, it, it gives me so much joy. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, when it comes to mentoring, there are so many that are offering uh, uh, similar or such programs, uh, maybe as yours. Give uh, our young people who are maybe in the market looking for a mentor, give them some tidbits. Um, what should one look for in a mentor? Like before you even look for a mentor, you need to make sure you're ready and you're you're prepared for whatever that mentor is going to take you through. A lot of mentors do things in their process completely different. But if you are not prepared and you sit with your mentor that first meeting and that mentor hits you with some stuff or slices you and you start bleeding and you get mad and angry and stop the process before you can get to the healing, then you weren't ready to start mentoring. So you have to be prepared to be cut. You have to be you have to be prepared to be to to be critiqued, to be held accountable to the content of your character. Um, you have to be willing to do the work. I hate when mentees spend all of this money, say they want a mentor, and you give them homework and assignments to do and books to read and things to help them, and they don't do the work. And then they get mad that they're stagnant. And so you have to be held accountable to doing the work in order to get to the other side. You would not expect a paycheck and you didn't work for it. It's not fair. And so for you to expect healing from me and you're not doing the work, it's not fair. And so I think it's really important that you seek a mentor that's honest that um, has integrity and, and matches the a faith built belief that you believe in, because a lot of times things are a spiritual situation and not a natural situation. So you need to have someone who can look at things both ways and, and be able to advise you in that way. You need to have someone who's compassionate and, and may un have an understanding or an expertise in some of the trauma you have gone through. I get a lot of people who battle with infertility. I get a lot of people who have battled with domestic violence or, or marriages because I have experience in those areas. So find someone whose testimony sounds like something that resonates with you. Uh, find someone who's honest, who has someone that holds them accountable. That is a big thing. Do not have a mentor that does not have a mentor. That's dangerous for you to have someone hold you accountable, but they don't have anyone to hold them accountable. So you need to find someone who has someone to hold them accountable. You need to have, you need to find someone who has a mentor that is guiding them because if you, if they don't have anyone holding them accountable and they don't have anyone guiding them, then when they get hit with their big battles, they won't have the capacity to help carry you out of your battle because they don't have anyone holding them accountable and pushing them through their own. Mm. That is good. So, so good. Uh, since it's on the table, who who are some of your mentors in this season? 
Oh, Marcia Morrison is one of my really great mentors. I call her TT Marcia. Um, Dr. Galena White is one of my amazing mentors and spiritual mother. Um, Tiffany Montgomery is, is like my big sister, mentor, corrector, critiquer, challenger, all things wonderful, all things amazing. I love her. Um, and, and my mom and father, you know, they mentor me, hold me accountable. I have ninjas that mentor me and hold me accountable that I will not release their names because they're ninjas for a reason. Um, but I have, I have people always surrounding me that can tell me, Hey, Cora, that's not a good idea. Or maybe you should do something different or don't say it that way. You know, I, I am an advocate for accountability because it keeps me out of trouble. I'm very blunt and very direct. And so I need people around me who can say, okay, that's a little bit too much, Brian. You need to put a little Cora in there. And so it keeps me accountable to not being like terribly blunt because I, I can be terribly blunt. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. Um, you mentioned uh, Bishop and your mom, Lady Sarita. Um, and I have to ask this question because there are so many who are in your uh, position uh, coming from such greatness, uh, whether it be uh, the music industry, business, uh, faith based um uh, ministry, uh, whatever it may be, but they spend many years and a lot of time running away from um, what it is that has been built, um, not necessarily in shame or or in disrespect, but just uh, to find their own way, to find their own um, uh, existence outside of what it is their parents have built. I'm curious, uh, what was that process like for you uh, coming from such great men and women of faith? Uh, how did you find your own voice, your own lane? your own purpose? Well, you know, I, I'm kind of at a disadvantage when it comes to this particular question. And that is because ever since I was a little girl, I wanted to be a preacher. And so like kindergarten graduation, I was like, I'm Cora Jake, I'm five years old. When I grow up, I'm going to be a preacher just like my daddy. I studied him almost like a university uh, from five, even up to now, I still study him. And so I think in, in a period like maybe between 18 and 20, I was like scared of what God was showing me. And so I ran a little bit, kind of jogged away for a second because I was real nervous about what, what God was showing me. And so I was like, yeah we're good. It's fine. So I'm going to go and, you know, I'm going to go to the clubs, you know, I'm 18. I'm going to go to the club. And I hated it. And it smelled like smoke and alcohol and really bad feet. And so I was like, <laughs> um, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work for me. And so I ended up just running again into myself. Um, not trying to be my father, but trying to carry his legacy in such a way that people would know that he was a part of me. Um, I think that, that so many people uh, use it as a criticism to say that I, I talk so much like my father, I preach like my father, but I see it so much more than that. I see it as a treasure. I see it as effective legacy. Because if you're, if you're effectively carrying a legacy, um, then you should see the imprint of my father. You can see the imprint of my mother. You can see the imprint of my mother and father in all of my siblings if you, if you looked hard enough. And so for me, it's been really about me being authentically me. Um, I can preach, I can laugh, I can joke, I am a free spirited person. And like I said, I'm very blunt. So I think my dad was very nervous about how people were going to receive me, because I'm just kind of like, take it or leave it. <laughs> So um, being able to come out and people like really receive me for just like my authentic character 
has been really, really awesome. And I think that's the best, the, uh, the best advice I could give to anyone is like, be your authentic self because no one can fight you about your truth. You know, like you're not going to start an argument with me about anything that is true to me. Um, and, and I don't change for people. I'm a very consistent person. I'm thinking about putting it on my tombstone, bury me consistent. Okay. Because I'm a very consistent person. And so I think that it's important that in, in you being any type of mega preacher, mega celebrities child, that you are authentically yourself and that you are unapologetically you. And in doing that, be prepared for people who don't like it. Be prepared for people who are so afraid of being themselves that they can't do anything but tear you down. Be prepared for people who are um, insecure and so they do not like your confidence. And so they try to see if they can break you to see if your confidence is real. Be prepared for that and bless them and block them. <laughs> that's it that's it uh listen there we're in the middle of this pandemic and um governments around the country are encouraging uh faith-based uh, institutions i.e churches uh to reopen their doors and welcome the communities back in um how are uh is it with you guys there at the potter's house how is uh bishop and the team there how are you guys moving forward in that effort well, I can't speak for my daddy, but I can sure enough speak for myself. Now, listen, when we did not have a pandemic, y'all would bring your snotty nose, fever having, crying during worship, body fluids all over the sanctuary when we didn't have a pandemic. We are not about to open up the church service so that you can vomit demons all over the pews and you can cry and snot your droplets all over the sanctuary and give everybody Corona. No one is interested in renaming their churches Corona, okay? Because that is what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. We stay in church for hours and hours. The fact that you could even try to compare a grocery store to some of these eight, five hour services that we have is ridiculous. And so I think that everybody needs to stay in their house. Enjoy this streaming time because when the church was open, guess what? Catch this, you didn't go. And so now that the church doors are closed, you want to be upset about them being closed. But the reality is you're just mad because your choice has been taken from you. Okay, your choice has been taken from you. You're a little salty about that and it's fine. Everybody can be salty, but we're not opening the church so that y'all can make everybody sick well intended but uh yeah no it's not happening my daddy is 63 my mama is about to be 65 ain't nobody got time for y'all making my parents sick for the for, for what because y'all can't watch tv y'all can't watch a computer screen child bye that's my thoughts on it I don't know what my father's thoughts are. I can't speak for him, but I can show them speak for myself. And I think everybody needs to sit down and act like Corona is real. Okay. Corona protests and Corona will go to church too. Corona will go to church. She's not above church. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. And it is so true. Um uh well we have to cover your book, The Ferocious Warrior. Uh in your book you discuss the P principles of faith. Give us some of those principles and why they are important. Okay, so listen, I have so many different acronyms and principles that before we even came on the call, I was trying to figure out which book has the P principles of faith. So I think, I think faithing it has the P principles of faith. And so those are, um, oh Lord, that was 2014, Jesus help. Uh, process, promise, perspective, and perseverance. And then I've got the P principles of prayer, which is in Ferocious Warrior as um, this, my latest book. And a few of them, I can't give them all to you because get the book, um, is our position. 
So, so how your heart is positioned in prayer, um, what posture you have, not, not if you're on your knees or if your head is bowed, but the posture of your heart towards God in prayer is so important. Because when we come to God in prayer, we have to remember that we're coming to him through his son. And so if we do not have a pure heart and we try to, it's, it's almost like putting um, the wrong kidney into someone's body, they'll reject it. And so if you try to put a heart of prayer that is not pure, through Christ, it will be rejected. And so you have to make sure that the position of your heart is pure towards God. And a lot of that takes, you know, looking at yourself, examining thine own self, letting God know you angry about some things you don't want to tell him you angry about, uh, sacrificing some, some self gratifications and pleasures and temptations that we tend to fall into just because it's our, our sinful nature and fleshly nature. It's going to take being able to really reposition your heart towards God. So that's one of those P principles. The other P principle is your, your power. And, and what I mean by that is the Bible, whenever we see power being given in the Bible, there was nothing that had to be done for Jesus to give it or for God to release it. All we had to do was reach for it. The woman with the issue of blood didn't have to do anything to receive power, but reach for it. When we look at the scripture, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but power, he's given it to us. When we think of Luke 10, 19, he says, I've given you authority. Another word for authority is power. So we never see a place where power is something we have to work hard for. So it's not a lack of power given, it is a lack of power being used. And so sometimes when I pray, I have to remind myself of the power that I hold within me to bring down strongholds, to tear down generational curses and to unlock generational blessings. This is when we know that we're really operating in power. When you are not just talking about the cliches that you grew up hearing about in prayer, but your prayer begins to transform and you start unlocking things that we don't commonly hear. Do, do you realize that we don't commonly hear God unlock generational blessings, but we have commonly grown up hearing break and destroy every generational curse. And so this power puts us in a position to shift ourselves in such a way to handle God and what he is saying in an authority and in a boldness, um, confident in, in the power therein, confident in what he has given us, confident in knowing that if God says that I can have it, it's mine. And so whatever it is that the enemy is bringing to me, if my heart is positioned right, if my power is, is activated and I'm operating in that power that God has given me, I didn't have to do anything for it, but reach. And so once we activate that power, right, and we take on that power that God has given us, then we understand evidence. We start to see victory. When you can walk in power, you don't get to walk in a victim. And, and so when you're walking in victory and praying versus walking as a victim and praying, it's different. Listen, I'm not saying that victims' prayers don't get through. I'm saying that the heart of the victim and the heart of a victor are different. And so you have to understand what position your heart is taking on when you pray. And when you put your heart through Christ, so that God may hear you, so that God may receive your prayer, be sure that you put a pure heart in there. You put a real heart in there. You don't, you don't try to hide your bitterness. You don't try to hide your anger. You don't try to hide your, your insecurities, but that you give God the full truth of you. Some of us are, are stagnant because we won't tell God our truth. 
some of us can't move forward in our relationship with God because we won't tell him that we're angry. We won't tell him that we're disappointed. We won't tell him that this is hard. We won't tell him our truth. And so because we avoid self-examination and telling our truth, we end up disconnecting from our relationship with God. And so then you start hearing people pray and you're like, man, I wish I could pray like that. Or, or man, how could you pray like that? Or teach me how to pray like that. But the reality is you put a heart that was not true in Christ and tried to get it to God. And until you are ready to give God the truth of your heart, until you're ready to put through Christ what is true about what's going on in your heart and your mind and your spirit and your soul, you cannot expect to produce until you put a full seed in the ground. If you cut a seed in half and put it in the ground and water it, it's not going to fully produce what you were looking for had you planted a full seed. Had you planted a full seed in the heart of Christ and sent it to God, what you produce would look different. So we have to stop lying to God. We have to stop lying to ourselves. We have to stop thinking that it's not okay for us to tell God how we really feel and then pray anyway. We have to stop worrying and stressing about our relationship with God, not deal with it, not pray, not read our word, and then wonder why we're not being blessed. So when we're in alignment with the perfect position of God's will for our lives and we take on that power that he has given us, then what we produce, which is another principle, will look different. I was just talking the other day um, to someone and I was telling them that the substance of what you're standing on is just as important as your faith. If you are not willing to examine your substance, then it's very possible that you have a bunch of seeds in the ground, but the problem is not the seed. And the problem is not the seed giver, but the problem is the substance that the seed is being planted in. And until we can change our substance, we are not gonna be able to produce fully in faith what God is trying to show us that we have yet to see. Mm, so good. So good. Listen, uh, we have to talk faith for a minute. And I, in this in this instance, I want to talk about uh, because we're in this season uh, where many are believing God, praying for loved ones, um, praying uh, for health and healing um, and, and believing God to restore. And, 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 and sometimes and in many instances, as, as we've seen since this pandemic has been uh, going on, uh, it doesn't happen the way we may uh, have planned or may thought it would um, speak to that area of faith. What is one uh, to do when they stand in faith and they believe God uh, to restore and, and, and it doesn't happen quite how they planned? Absolutely. I think the, the first thing that I would address is that we tend to hold faith just solely responsible to our belief. But faith is not just solely responsible to our belief, but it is solely responsible to our trust as well. And when you trust someone or trust God, then you trust that whatever he decides, you believe it is for the best. And so trust is going to come before your belief when it comes to faith. So when I pray, I am trusting that whatever God decides to do with what I'm praying about is for my best interest. That's faith. Faith does not say my prayers are going to change God's mind. That is not faith. Faith says, I trust that whatever God believes for my life will happen according to my belief that he can do it, according to my trust that he can do it, according to me. This is why the Bible says that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above anything you could ever ask or think according to the power that works in you. 
It's not about your belief in, in just God, but it's about your trust in you, your trust to believe that there's a power that works in you, that whatever God decides that it's going to be a benefit, that healing doesn't just happen on earth. Sometimes the best healing, when you consider the condition of the earth, the best healing is death. If we want to get technical, if we, if we want to get technical, if you consider the conditions of this world and you consider the pandemics of this world and you consider how people are hurting and killing each other and, and everything is going to hell in a handbasket pretty quick here, it, it would seem that when you pray for healing to a God that is looking at this world, that he would not keep you in a world that is not healed while you're praying for healing. You want him to heal the body of the person in a land that is not healed. Mm. And so Ooh. when we pray and ask God for healing, you, you need to be specific because when God sees healing, he sees the land that he leaves you on. He sees your surroundings and your situations. When you pray and ask God for healing, he's not just looking at the hospital. He's looking at your emotional healing. He's looking at your physical healing, your surrounding healing, your mental healing, your financial healing. He's not just a one-sided God. You don't just pray for him for a hospital view. He's a 360 kind of God. And so if he's sees that if I take her, she'll be better than if I leave her in this world that is already sick and dying, then I'm probably going to go ahead and take her. Healing doesn't get to work the way you want to work it. Healing works the way that works for God. Mm, my, my, my. Ooh, that was meat straight off the bone. My goodness. Well, with all that's going on, uh, we're getting ready to let you go. But with all that's going on, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, <laughs> racism in America. <clears throat> I mean, the list is endless. Black Lives Matter, social injustice, police brutality. I mean, we could go on and on. Um, with all of this that's going on, what have you learned in this whole experience? Oh, that's such a good question. I've learned so many things, but I think. One of the greatest lessons I have learned throughout all of this is the resilience of our people. Um, I, I think that, again, as a culture, we are so empowered, we are so resilient, we are so um, just strong beyond what man can even fathom. And, and I'm learning that. I'm learning even more the strength of the Black person. I'm learning even more the threat that we pose. And, and for me, I've always felt like if, if I am a threat to the enemy, that's huge, you know? Like there must be something just absolutely amazing in me that they don't want me to grow. They don't want me to live. They don't want me to breathe. There must be something so strong and so powerful about us as a culture that we pose such a threat from something that God gave us. That is like just a powerful revelation that I am like finding like, okay, the thing that y'all are threatened the most about is the thing that God gave me. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I'm learning that I'm learning that we are a powerful culture. I'm learning that we are resilient. I'm learning that we are strong and we will overcome that. Is, that is just something that is inherited victory for our people is that we will overcome. And it, it gives me great joy to see our um, white brothers and sisters standing alongside us. So I'm learning that too. I'm learning how, how much unity uh, I have within my friends that, are, that don't look like me. I'm learning all of that. God is exposing so much about relationships and things in this season. And so I'm trying to grab a hold of everything that he's teaching because there's most certainly a lot to learn. 
Yes, absolutely. Well, before I let you go, Cora, I got to get you to play this fun game with me. It's called My Five Favorites. Uh, what it is is I'll give you two options, and you tell me out of the two which is your favorite. Ready? Okay. Music or movies? Music. Sneakers or stilettos? Sneakers. Uh, Peloton or Pilates? Peloton. Pound cake or peach cobbler? Peach cobbler. (laughs) Saturday night or Sunday morning? Saturday night. (laughs) <laughs> wow. Well, thank you, Cora, so much for joining me. Listen, tell our listeners how they can connect with you, get the books and all that good stuff. Hello, visitors, viewers and watchers. Thank you so much again, bro, for having me. I had such a good time. You can follow me at C. Jakes Coleman everywhere. Periscope, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm everywhere. C. Jakes Coleman. If you want to be a mentee, you can go to cjakescoleman.storeenvy.com and register for a three session or a six week session with me. Um, And if you want to book me, you can go to cjakescoleman.com and book me for anything next year um, because we're not doing any any visits to the people of God for the rest of 2020. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Cora. I appreciate it. Listen, my best to you and the family. Uh, Stay safe and stay well. Well, this has been the Build on Beauty podcast, where beauty is born skin deep. I'm your host, Cornell Germain. Until next time, let your soul be made whole. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Build on Beauty podcast. For more information about our host, please visit CornellGermain.com.